We know our country has a health crisis, and we know what we've been told. Saturated fat raises cholesterol. Meat is not healthy. Eat a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. But there's a problem. Evidence based in science has little to do with our actual nutrition policy and our understanding about nutrition and that it was 90% politics. The obesity epidemic really began with the dietary guidelines. We've done what they said and the problems have only been getting worse. It was a perfect storm of bad science. This is the most important story in the history of public health and almost no one has heard it. Hey everyone, it is great to be back on the HVMN program. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. A lot to go on the world in the digest and process, but also a lot of interesting folks doing very interesting things that might not necessarily have to relate to either social justice or pandemics, but are very important to day-to-day -day health and living and wellness. So I'm really excited to bring on my next guest, Brian Sanders. Hey, welcome to the program. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Yeah, crazy times, huh? How are you doing? Everything okay with family, friends? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing well. I'm in LA. I'm in the Marina del Rey, Venice Beach. It's kind of quiet down here, but this whole time I've just been focusing on keeping myself healthy, you know, having a good immune system, eating well, exercising, getting out in the sun. I think we actually share a lot of mutual interests here. I know that you have an awesome podcast called Peak Human, which obviously kind of hints towards the notion of how do we have better performance, better health, better wellness. And you've also spent a lot of time synthesizing a lot of the information research around nutrition, which of course is something that I spent a lot of time doing as well. So I know you're a mechanical engineer by background and I'm a computer scientist. So kind of interesting that we came from kind of quantitative engineering perspectives going into human performance. Yeah, no, I, I think it helps. I mean, I, I have a lot of doctor friends and we hear a lot of doctor people that I interview and they say they were kind of entrenched in a system and they kind of learned one way of thinking and couldn't look at it from all angles. And so I think coming from a different perspective helps. And yeah, this I came mechanical engineering, went to UCLA. I grew up in Hawaii. And uh, the UCLA engineering program taught me to think critically, root cause, you know, look at the problem, look at sort of a systems approach. And that I think that carried on to help me get into this health world. And yeah, I had a, a brief tech career as well. I, I got into, you know, tech startups and apps and all that type of stuff and had my own little company for a while. And finally, just uh, took health as my number one concern. My parents had some health problems. Basically, uh, at age 30, I lost both parents. And I also had my own health problems where you, not exactly problems, but you can't, that's about the time when you can't eat whatever you want anymore, right? Things start catching up to you. And so, started focusing on my own health and saw so many changes. It was so amazing to go from someone... I thought I was healthy. I thought I was just fine. Like I was sort of the fit guy in the group. And I look back at my before and after pictures and I think I looked terrible back then. I, you know, just, <laughs> it's kind of funny and how, how I used to get sick all the time. I had all these different things that went away. You know, a lot of people have some amazing health journeys and it's great. Oh, I lost a hundred pounds. I lost 200 pounds. But mine is like, I'm more of the every man, the every person where you know, you thought you're doing well, and then you found a whole new level once you've made some changes. That resonates with me personally. I mean, I think I was kind of a nerdy science math kid growing up. And it was kind of like going to college, you know, go to the gym a couple, maybe three times a week. And, and then you look back and you thought like, hey, I was like going to the gym, I was trying to be active and maybe do like your mile run on the treadmill and maybe do some weights. But now I think now looking back, and engaging and really spending this as really a career, I think, for, for both of us, a huge difference looking back and what we thought was good versus what I think is a new standard or what maybe should be the actual standard that we all live and aspire to. Well, exactly. Yeah, that, that's why I'm on such a mission. I guess my parents have a big part in that. But just the fact that everyone could be out there, this is what a human should live like. And no one not no one. <laughs> I think there's very few people in the modern society that live like the homo sapien that they should be. Yeah. So, I want to get into your story a little bit. I know that I think a lot of people attune towards health. I mean, it sounds like a very tragic time with both your parents passing. I think obviously that's a, that must be a, a huge catalyst. But what triggered you from going from, hey, this is a personal focus and orientation to, hey, I should uh, maybe build a career and, and start like, a new career in this area. 
Really? It was when I saw What the Health. <laughs> it's kind of funny. That was three years ago. It was a summer. That really put me over the edge because I was already into this world for a couple of years. But then when I saw that film, and I was getting back into film actually at that time, I grew up in film. I, I couldn't watch it. I was, this is so backwards. This is going to confuse the public more. Overall, it was more harm than good because it scares people away from eating meat. It confused them on the whole story of what humans evolved eating and what you know makes an optimum diet. And then the game changers came around that confused people even further. So, yeah, I really just wanted to spread a message of a simple message of what can we do to live like humans and and not get tied up in any camp. That's one of my big things is not getting too down a rabbit hole in an echo chamber or just believing one side of things and looking at all sides of, of nutrition. Yeah, that's actually, I think, where I like to approach my program as well, which is that I don't care. I don't make money if I'm a carnivore or a vegan. Let's mm -hmm. just actually look at the data of mm -hmm. what what interventions are better for individuals? And there's probably variation between people. There's different contexts, there's different applications and different goals for people. And people should be armed with the knowledge and potential protocols to implement to achieve their specific personal goals. So I'm 100% aligned with you in terms of bring on smart folks, present their cases. But yeah, try not to be necessarily judgmental because I don't think that's necessarily the role of science. The science is not to prejudge. The role of science is to collect data. Absolutely. That's all that matters. And just to even just touch on what's going on in the world today, so much of the science is being politicized. So I don't have any dog in the fight really either way. I've never tried to take sides. But it's, it's just, it turns political. And so I'd rather just look at the actual data, look at the actual science and not be bought into an ideology. And it's hard. Some people, they say, oh, I'm the carnivore guy. So now you're, you're stuck in that. And like, what if you yeah. change? You're screwed, right? So it's, yeah. it, I think you and I, we're, we're, we're not going to get into a camp and then we can never be backed in a corner and then be wrong in a sense or have to try to support something that maybe doesn't work. I think the camp, if I had to sign up for a camp, it's a camp of science, not necessarily worrying about an appeal to authority. Let's just look at the data and let's evolve our thinking, given new information. It sounds like for your journey here, you saw some of these documentaries. They didn't quite line up with what you had self-taught and learned through your own personal studies and research. And that kind of got you on this journey of, okay, I could do a better job in terms of producing content and producing film to help educate the population. Is, is, was that about the right gist of your personal journey there? Yeah. If you just go so hard on the vegan side, I mean, I think there's many diets that can work and the, the completely plant-based diet is not one of them that without, you know, tons of supplementation or I just don't think it's what humans should be doing. So I would say the same thing if I saw a completely carnivorous movie, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't like rally behind it and, and think it was great either. Like I'd love to dive into the the ar arguments or articulation there for a quick minute here. So if we're looking at game changers, I think there's been a lot of people who have done debunking videos as well as people kind of re-articulating some of the arguments that the film makes. What is your synthesis there? And then in your own research, what have you seen as some pillars that are good foundations for a proper diet. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I did a whole film debunking the Game Changers film. And I mean film as in YouTube uh, video, <laughs> but it was the same length as their film. Yeah, I basically put out a post on social media said, who wants to throw in $3 and let's debunk this thing and got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people and raised enough money to, you know, pay an editor. And we just did the whole thing in about three weeks. So we kind of break down all the arguments and explain why they're wrong. And I guess the, the main thing I, I keep going back to this, looking at both sides thing is that was a, a viewpoint of one side, or you could even look at a bigger interest of James Cameron, you know, having 150, 170 million dollars, whatever it was in the pea protein company. And, you know, they, they go in with these certain ideas. And I, I mean, I don't know if it's monetary or he, he just believes that this is a healthy way to eat, but these people come in with, and they only show you one side. I mean, there's even a guy in there, Richard Rangham, who's a you know well-known scientist that wrote the book Catching Fire, I believe it's called, about of how fire changed human history. And we started eating meat, and we started cooking meat, and you know, I guess we cooked some tubers as well, and this helped. 
and uh, get more energy to our brains and bodies. And we evolved. And then they, they clipped out like, you know, 10 seconds of him saying something that made it sound like he believed that we were plant eaters when he wrote a whole book on, you know, how meat eating was so crucial in the human diet. So that's an example of what the film does. They, it's called cherry picking. Everyone listening should know that. And that's how they did a whole film. They cherry picked their data. And I'm trying to not do that. I'd love to make a film that couldn't be debunked. That's my whole goal and all the things I do on social media. It's, the film's called Food Lies. I don't know if we made that clear. And I'm Food Lies on all these different social media channels. Like I said, n- make something that's not able to be debunked, where we're going to look at both sides. We're not going to cherry pick. We're just going to see how humans evolved. You know, what are we supposed to eat? Where did we go wrong in the science? I mean, I don't know if we, we could go over sort of a, the broad strokes of the film, but that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, we, I think it would be helpful to just get a preview of the broad strokes and maybe dive into particular areas and, and sure. do light, light, light discussion on some of the broad strokes here. Yeah, yeah. So, we kind of split it up pretty distinctly in, in sort of five categories where we do go human evolution. We say, where did we come from, right? This dictates a lot there we started eating meat three and a half million years ago we were scavenging you know animals off of other people's other animals kills and then you know two million years we developed tools we fire all this is amazing human evolution story of how our bodies changed our guts changed our face changed our, our jaws our teeth like so many parts of our body changed because of our diet and so that's really important on what we believe now so part of the problem now is we're looking at things very myopically. We're, we're doing, we have great science now and great instruments and different ways to study tiny little things and tiny little mechanisms. But sometimes we get so myopic, we're like, oh my God, IGF-1. And wow, if you eat meat, you know, it's going to raise IGF-1. It's like, well, what if you eat carbs? It raises IGF-1 as well. And you should always check with kind of human evolution in a way, right? It's like a guiding star. Right? So, if you, you use it as a guiding star, then you can use modern science. Of course, we're not saying, oh, let's just eat what cavemen ate. Like that's, no one's saying that. I, I, I hope no one thinks that. Or even the paleo movement was doing a little bit of that. But there's more to the story than just what did we eat during the paleolithic times. So, we can use human evolution as a guiding light, guiding star, but we're not just going to you know, throw out everything else. You could get really off base if you only look at, at, if you're so myopic, you're not looking at the guiding star to use that analogy. And you're just looking, say, at your smartphone and you, you say you typed in the wrong address and you went to a completely wrong city on, on, in your, on your Google Maps because you didn't really or you didn't zoom out and look. Oh, wait, I just typed in an address that was, you know, in San Diego, but I was trying to go to Santa Barbara. Right. So that I think people do that. Honestly, people do that in science these days when you you have to kind of zoom out and be like, okay, let's see this overview of this map. Am I going south or north? So, yeah, it's human evolution. Then we get into this whole agricultural revolution, you know, kind of like where we went wrong or what happened there. And then then there's this bad science section of we got a lot of things wrong. You know, most people know about the sort of Ansel Keys and cholesterol and saturated fat. You know, we kind of went astray with these ideas. Then we go into the new science. It's like, oh, wait, now we have all these awesome new studies showing that, you know, maybe he was wrong or maybe saturated fat isn't bad. And then we kind of synthesize that to like, what should we eat? Like, how do we eat? Is our framework and which we not eat? And then we do it. How do we do this sustainably? Right. So now we know, oh, animal foods are great. But how do we do it in a regenerative fashion where we can actually, you know, heal the environment instead of hurting it. So there's the film right there. That's a really nice arc, and I love to have a discussion on each of the, uh, the the points there. And I really like this notion of a guiding star and some of the myopic nature of academic science today. And I and I see that quite personally. And it's not to say that scientists are myopic. I think it's value in specialization at the forefront of academia, right? Like we need to understand, I think it's valuable to understand, okay, how does mTOR work? How does IGF-1 work? And you have to understand, okay, this macronutrient or this potential drug has this target. There's value in that. But I think what is interesting from a policy perspective or a recommendation perspective is how does this actually sit within human evolution? And I think that is an interesting 
uh, question that I think is beyond the academy. That's where I think people start beginning to speak out of their expertise. Multiple disciplines need to come together to help people make best personal decisions. Um, one thing that I, I've just seen personally is that, and I, I agree with exactly how you articulate it, that being like a caveman is not the goal. Like there's clearly benefits of technology and new understanding that probably should manipulate and alter uh, what the cavemen used to do. Mm-hmm. But I think it is valuable that there's this Lindy effect or something that some practices have lasted for literally millions of years. There might be some signal there. And I think that's what got me kind of personally interested in relooking at sun exposure or light exposure, looking at diet, looking at types of exercises to do. Uh, these are just more ancestrally consistent. This is not to say that old is good and let's be Luddites. This is saying, hey, Let's let's look at this from a modern lens and see how this might translate. And I think being inspired, having guiding star of hey, these are interesting signals to look at. It's a very very sensible way when we're talking about translating myopic science or very very specialized science into broader recommendations. Yeah, it's super important to do both. So yeah, I'm not saying yeah we there's no room for these super myopic studies. It's super important to do both. And you know what's interesting to think about. Humans are super smart. Like just because we didn't have the instruments and technology a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, doesn't mean we we're any different. Our brains were almost the same, right? I mean, maybe there are some new changes recently because we have so much data flying around, we can process data faster. I don't know what uh, what people think about that, but I know that our brains didn't change much, right? We still had the same capacity for cognitive function. And we looked at the signals and what we had, and we looked at trial and error, and we looked at what worked and what didn't. And it's kind of funny that in the nutrition world, especially, is we mostly got things wrong once we went away from that. It's amazing how, you know, we did so many things right up until 100 years ago, 50 years ago. And it's almost all this science made us go completely opposite. You know, most people know, oh, yeah, flip the food pyramid upside down, that type of thing. But I mean, it's almost we went exactly opposite on everything. You mentioned sunlight. We spent so many years telling people to get out of the sun, be afraid of the sun, all this stuff. And now people's vitamin D levels are at all time low. And people have, you know, there's all these studies coming out about the COVID deaths and, and extreme cases are way worse when people have these very low vitamin D levels. So yep. it's salt is right. I mean, it's just funny how wrong we got it once we we started busting out all the, the supposedly good science. Yeah, anything before moving on to the kind of agricultural revolution, which I think is an interesting discussion topic, anything that that you've adopted personally that has been inspired from ancestral practices? Um, I think sunlight is like one of an interesting example. It sounds like you're kind of in line with like I saw a recent Times article magazine saying, hey, you should put sunscreen indoors. And it's just what? like Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 they had they had affiliate links out to like to Amazon, so I think they get a kickback for it. And I don't want to get too conspiracy around like a potential yeah. business model need in terms of pumping sunscreen, but it's like yeah, all time lows of vitamin D. We already are in boxes of our house, especially in uh, current shelter in place quarantine. We're literally some of us are twenty four seven in a box. That wasn't ancestrally consistent. Anything that you've adjusted in your personal lifestyle that's like, hey, like this is actually a good thing that I, could, I should incorporate? Yeah. So, I'm a little bit of like a anti-biohacker biohacker. <laughs> so, I am really into this, but I'm trying to see how much I can do without getting a whole bunch of gadgets. And so, yeah, so I do. I get outdoors every day. I'm getting my sun. I'm getting my between the you know 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. when there's a big good UVB rays, I'm out there by the pool or in a grass reading a book, getting 20 minutes on each side of my body. I did the whole sleep thing, but I I think it's super important just to give yourself enough time to be in bed. Most people don't need a bunch of gadgets if you're not even giving yourself the opportunity to be in bed for eight hours to get the good sleep. And uh, the, the working out aspect, I do a lot more ancestrally, I think, of I love these brief, intense workouts. So I know there's some people love cardio and there's a time and place for that. And if you like it, do it. But for me, when I look back at my workout routines and my body composition, I was doing mostly cardio and I looked terrible. I just had like a terrible body composition. 
And I haven't done cardio, like specifically jogging type of things in two years. And I'm in the best shape of my life. And, you know, all I did was start doing, I guess, using more ancestral movements, more brief, intense stuff. I, you know, I put on a 40 pound weight vest and do pull ups and dips. And I go to failure, I take the weight vest off and do more. You know, I do these drop sets so I can really hit failure on my, my muscles. And then I'm done. I, I love this. I, people probably know Dr. Ted Naiman. I've been friends with him for years and I'm, she's just right on on so many things. And yeah, I mean, I, throw around some dumbbells when my gym was open i would be you know be doing some dumbbells just do do big movements compound movements squats and bench you know dumbbell press and i mean i just saw so many more gains it's so efficient coming from the the scientific perspective again it, you know it's how efficient can we be and it's like i can spend 16 17 minutes in the gym and get more gains than i've ever gotten I mean, I think, again, in shelter in place and quarantine, we don't necessarily have our access to our bench presses and squat bars. So, I've been doing a lot of calisthenics. Like, one of the things that I've done was just do a Murph a day for 45 days in a row. And that's a lot of pull-ups, push-ups, and air squats. Um, so, it sounds like you're doing like, a lot of high-intensity interval training type activities. Like, any special movements? So, it sounds like a lot of weighted pull-ups, which I think are, are great. It's a very, I think especially consistent movement of pulling yourself above obstacles. It makes sense. Anything else in terms of movements that you found highly efficient or, or interesting or, or something that you personally like? Sprinting is another one though. So sprinting is super big for me. So I don't do... So when I switch from jogging to sprinting, I, I cut the time down by maybe a fourth. And I think I got better results. And there's a great doctor, Sean O'Mara, who does a lot of MRIs on people and is a really big proponent of sprinting and has found that his clients or patients uh, lose a ton of visceral fat, you know, looking at it in the MRI um, when they change diets and when they do start implementing sprinting. And specifically, one guy who was doing a lot of long distance stuff and changed nothing about his diet, but just moved to sprinting, uh, ra uh, just drastically reduced his visceral fat uh, by doing that in a couple of weeks or months. It was two months probably. That's something that I thought about a, a lot as well where, and I just want to almost just pose it to the audience here. When is the last time you have sprinted? Meaning you literally want to throw up after that exercise or that bout. And I remember like realizing that I, and this is a while ago, like I probably haven't sprinted since like high school. Mm -hmm. Like unless you're an athlete, in a sprint rate, like you're not, no one's ever even sprinting anymore. And that seems again, in, from an ancestral perspective, something that you would probably tap into going maximal effort for 10, 15, 20 seconds or, or whatever that, you know, sprint duration might be. You don't necessarily need the RCT there, but it's just like, okay, we probably sprinted every now and then. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that anymore. It probably is something that challenges system in a positive way, just to have that acute little stress there to be like, hey, I'm going maximal effort. I think it's huge. I So, Dr. Sean O'Mara, I did a podcast with him, but he's been doing this for years on in his own world and doing dozens or hundreds of MRIs on people and, and doing all these things. But I just found this myself. I mean, I used to play a lot of flag football even in my 30s. And the, when we were in season, my... I was doing the same amount of exercise kind of overall, but my body composition was way better. And I think it was just because of those bouts of sprinting as I was a wide receiver my whole life. And, you know, it's intermittent sprinting. I, I just think there's huge benefits there. And, and yes, and it doesn't take long. You can do 10, 20 second sprints, right? And, and it really challenges your body. It just does something different. It's hard to explain. <laughs> just, I'd, yeah. I'd say try it. Yeah. Get out there and try it. I agree. I mean, yeah, if you if you sprint 100 meters, you do that 10 times, dude, I, like you you want to throw up. Like if you properly actually sprint 100 meter dashes, it's not easy. Like it, It's a real workout. And then I'd say maybe just do 50 meters because pe you don't want people <laughs> puking on the first day they do it. So, <laughs> yeah, get out there and do 10 50 meter sprints and you're going to you're going to feel great. You're going to get a real workout. Yeah. Let's rotate to agriculture. Agriculture revolution, probably one of the most impactful developments of technology that changed how humans lived. You would, you know, I think one could say the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and now uh, the technology revolution, whatever we want to describe this notion of trans 
translating online. Um, let's talk about the agriculture revolution. That's kind of a, it's a controversial topic uh, in a way because there's people say, you know, Jared Diamond famously said the agriculture revolution was the biggest mistake in human history, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And people may have read his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Mm. Great book. But I, I mean, I've talked to guys like uh, Professor Bill Schindler is another uh, friend of mine who's in the film and he's an experimental archaeologist. He's a paleontologist. He studies this. He's done so much. He travels the world trying to study how humans lived and ate. He really has mapped out, you know, what, the entire human history from when we were primates to now and how our food, our diet and lifestyle change. And and so, a great story of his was about the agricultural revolution is when he was in his undergraduate degree, they brought out two remains of humans. And they said, which one do you think is the, the modern one and which was the ancient one? And I mean, the, this was when they were early on in their studies. So, maybe most people thought that the, the one that was much taller and stronger and the healthier looking one was a modern one, but it was, it was actually the opposite. It was that that's what we used to look like. We had bigger brains, we were taller, we had less disease, we had thicker, you know, we were more robust back before the agricultural revolution. So many people have heard that actually, that, you know, since that we've changed and we've gotten less healthy and that being sedentary in not the fact that we were more sedentary per se, because we probably worked out about the same, you know, I've been investigating this a lot for this section of the film is that, yeah, I mean, hunter gatherers, it's not like they were constantly running and hiding, you know, they had time to relax. And, and the same thing with these, when, once we settled down, we still were working in the fields and there's actually data showing that we actually spent way more time producing food after we settled down and, and invented agriculture. So there's so many things kind of on both sides of that, but basically the broad strokes are we started relying way more on these crops and less on, you know, going out and foraging for, for animals and our health got worse. And there could be other reasons. Some people have these different theories about, oh, well now since we're, you know, more in more grouped together that we uh, had more disease because of that. But, you know, you, you could pick apart that and, and show that that isn't necessarily true. There's a, um, people might know Dr. Michael Eads, he wrote Protein Power. It's a great kind of old school guy in, in this kind of high fat, low carb space. And he was, he did a whole presentation on these different North American uh, Native Americans that, and you, they looked at two different populations, one settled down and one didn't. And they both had the same amount of activity. They, but the one that was not relying on agriculture, the more hunter gatherer group had no, virtually no chronic diseases, you know, none of these problems that the other group did. So yeah, lots of, lots of go in there. Like, I think there's two ways I want to take this, which is, it looks like there's like a discongruity where if agriculture doesn't work, then why was it a dominant practice for so many cultures? So here's my reconciliation of it. And I'm curious to get your thoughts, which is that agriculture was a powerful technology that was optimal for a society or a group overall fitness, but it was negative on individual fitness. So what I mean by that is when you had agriculture, you had excess production, you could store these foods easier and you could potentially have specialization of uh, labor. So you could have farmers, then you could have warriors, leaders, religious figures, other folks that are specializing in other uh, technology production. Whereas hunter-gatherer societies, everyone is kind of a generalist. Uh, the the hunter-gatherer societies, each individual was generally had better individual fitness, but because the overall group fitness of an agriculture society, they could organize better while each individual might be less fit for battle or for war, for the overall organization of a farming society could outtake and therefore compete better on a societal level. So I think that helps at least from, from you know, my thinking explains why agriculture dominated and agriculture driven societies would end up being more successful than hunter gatherer societies. I think that's right on. That's exactly how it went, I think. And and you don't really notice these changes. See that they're so slow. It's kind of like just even people's diets over their lifetime. It's so slow. They just gradually 
get a pound, you know, uh, put on a pound each year and slowly get chronic disease. But it's even slower as a population level. And yeah, we got shorter, right? We know that nutrition is very correlated to height. And there's also a great study called 105 men in 105 countries that show the direct correlation between the quality animal protein, the quality protein, which is from animal foods and their height. And you, you can see it goes away from the equator. So the people relied more on plant foods closer to the equator and were shorter. And the people relying more on animal foods as you go north are taller. It's all kinds of great correlations about that. But uh, even just throughout history, we know when our nutrition was the worst, we were the shortest. And that you know, kind of like the, the plague periods in the middle, you know, 1500s type of place. And even <clears throat> in the you know 1800s and early 1900s. But we're climbing back now. So what we have now is an opportunity to kind of do both, right? Where we can focus back on the ancestral foods and then still have, you know, all the great technology at a population level. And one other aspect too was the imbalance of power where that's what also what drove it forward too is now that's when we started creating the inequality. It was a very egalitarian society before hunter gathers, everyone was sort of equal, but then when you started storing grain and people would started accumulating wealth and that's when, you know, Kings happen and, and land ownership and, and all that. So it makes sense why it was sort of perpetuated for so long, even though it might've maybe been a bit negative. Yeah. Like at least for me, I don't have a, uh moral judgment on which organization is quote unquote morally better. It just, I think I'm just speaking from an evolutionary and organizational fitness perspective, you know, having yeah, structure inequality, someone that's a strong leader able to master and, and conquer other tribes. So you can have organizations of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people versus your hunter gatherer tribe of 50, hundred people that just ends up again, from a moral perspective, that model has worked that or did work, right? Like that is why we have empires that like sort of traditional empires with kings and emperors and all of that. I mean, that's just that's, a historical, like kind of a, a experiment being run. Well, yeah. And well, that's why we have all the great technology. If we were just running around as hunter gatherers, we'd never have this computer we're using to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think I, but I, I, I land on a very similar point as you, which is that, okay. Um, now that we have a more enlightened understanding of how we came to be, which are systems we can try to update or upgrade or replace, and which are best practices we should reincorporate back into modern life or a proper, you know, enlightened modern life. And maybe this is a good segue into the scientific revolution and some of the uh, things you're notating in the, in the beginning of the conversation for the science and kind of the rigor of the last 50, 100 years has doubled down on some of the potentially wrong directions, which might look myopically correct, but didn't actually uh, translate well into chronic disease and yeah. health and overall health and fitness. So we started demonizing meat. So that was really interesting to me diving into this for the film is like, when did we ever think red meat was bad? That, that yeah. kind of was a turning point because for all of human history, it was a foundation of health. It was the most important food in human history. It was the one thing like large animals, ruminant animals, especially, you know, the, the cows and the bison and even the big megafauna, these giant woolly mammoths and things we used to eat were the most important food in human history. And then we started demonizing them. That's it's very strange, right? Because people valued meat all the way up until, I don't know, as recent as 1880 is when it started was there's this whole story about the seventh day adventists and i'm not gonna get into all these details but they're i mean ellen g white there they had this she had this idea that meat made, made men violent and angry and this was around the time of this woman's temperance movement and you know men were <laughs> violent and angry towards women back then and it was terrible and so they didn't really know what to attribute to and they're eating all this red meat and we we're also moving out of the cities and we weren't this was a time when we weren't connected to our farms anymore and and we just lost touch with how animal agriculture works and even fresh meat i mean maybe people even say well now we're transporting it we didn't have refrigeration maybe the meat was you know going bad and all this stuff started happening and there's a whole kellogg's he was part of this seventh day adventist group and he believed that you wanted to eat a pure diet that that, that this was the garden of eden diet that we want to eat sort of these bland foods to suppress sexual desires. It, it was this whole crazy story. Dr. Gary Fetke goes into, if anyone wants to look him up. Yeah. 
But uh, Harvey Kellogg, this is a guy, Kellogg cereal. And we started going towards this route of let's eat whole grains and all these grains are healthy. And, you know, then there's a whole story of using the industrial waste products from all these growing of grains and seeds to make oils. And we, we have these industrial seed oils that we thought were healthy. And then we have the Ansel Keys and the whole like President Eisenhower had a heart attack and he they started blaming cholesterol and we started looking at instead of looking at heart disease and all the sugars and refined foods and the oils we're eating we blamed it on meat and then you get into the 60s and 70s the hippie movement let's blame cows on the environment then you get farther and was, let's blame it on cancer and so really when you undo all that and you, you look back like hmm what if instead we did all this science based around this assumption that cholesterol and saturated fat were bad. And we did all this science based on thinking that LDL was the most important thing or total cholesterol was the most important thing. But if you remove that, if we never thought that cholesterol is bad and that LDL on its own was an, a, a very big indicator of heart disease, then everything kind of falls apart. And that we can look at all the other things that when people give up the sugars and the refined grains in their diet, their blood markers like HDL and triglycerides improve. You know, maybe that's a better indicator and in looking at the triglyceride to HDL ratio instead of the LDL. So, there, a bunch of new science has been done and people are still hung up on these kind of things of the past. And so, we're still blaming red meat for things. We're still confusing environmental issues with nutritional issues for another thing. You can, you know, you can say what you want. Factory farming isn't great. We know this. But you can't kind of combine the environmental issues with the nutritional issues. We need to look at what is healthy for humans. So we got a lot of things wrong. We have a lot of new studies proving that, you know, meat can be healthy if eaten in the correct way that, you know, there's tons of people on lower carb, high fat diets that are doing well. There's over 100 studies now. There's so much going on uh, scientifically that discredits our old views yeah and i'm just yeah i'm like as you mentioned it is curious to understand when and where meat got demonized so let's try to just break down the arguments and i think a lot of the confusion with the plant-based or the vegan argument is that it conflates i think three classes of arguments into one kind of mess which is there's an argument around individual health from removing meat from diet, we can t we can address and maybe talk about that specific argument. Then there's the environmental argument: is uh, factory farming or other types of regenerative farming practices that could be better than factory farming? Are these actually worse for the environment? Are we killing ourselves in the long term, killing Mother Earth, all that good stuff uh, with? eating animal meat. And I think there's like the third argument, which is the moral argument. Uh, is it evil to enslave other species, put them in cages and then kill them for sustenance? And I think there's potentially valid arguments to discuss in each of those buckets. Uh, and maybe we can help break it down and to at least give both sides on, on this. Cause I feel like a lot of the articulation from that side is just like this mess of like, undisciplined arguments that conflate all three of these forms of arguments together. Yeah. And a lot of the arguments are, are surface level arguments that once you dig a little deeper, you find out they unravel, right? So that's, that's how I think of each of those arguments is on the surface, it sounds correct. You know, I mean, if you talk to say just like a fifth grade kid, like if you explain to them these very basic arguments, you could convince them, Oh my God, I'm never gonna eat animals again. But yeah. if you kind of dive deeper you, you'll see that they unravel on each point. So the nutrition side, so a lot of that is, well, there's healthy user bias. There's just epidemiology. There's, it's just hard to do randomized control trials on animal foods, right? So th there's a big problem there where people, like you said, they can remove meat from their diet and maybe they'll feel better. And then, and, or you could even show studies like, oh, well, these people don't eat meat and they do great. But it, it, from all that I've gathered, it, it's not the meat, right? It's all the other things. I'm actually wearing a shirt right now that says, it's what else you eat, not the meat, right? And it says, <laughs> eat meat uh, it, and really big. It, it's what else you eat, not the meat. So, if you go to the fast food meal, 
The problem is on the meat. It's the bun. It's the fries. It's the soda. So yep. you, you just can't tease that out well in these studies that we've done, right? Everyone knows it would be super hard and super expensive to lock people in metabolic wards and try to do the real randomized control trial on this. But from all that I've gathered from all of history, even, you know, you look at ancient populations, you look at modern native living populations, and you look at just modern people. And you can see all these different dietary patterns. And the things that they have in common are more around their other healthy habits, right? That's a healthy user bias. All these people who do a billion other things well, they don't smoke, they drink less. Like we've even studied this. We know that they people who give up meat, they follow these recommendations. They, they smoke less, they drink less, they exercise more, they have better uh, communities and families, all this type of stuff. But the, also it's what they give up, right? It's what else you eat. So it's these people who who are giving up meat probably aren't going to McDonald's every day or eating tons of processed foods and chips and candies. I mean, if they're, they're taking care of themselves, they're, they're doing other good things. Let's not blame it on the food that we've been eating for all of history that has tons of bioavailable nutrients and vitamins and minerals. And let's look at what else could be going on. Maybe it's the sugars and refined grains and vegetable oils and all these things that we just brought into our diets in the last 100 years in a, in a large way. I mean, yes, we've had some of these things for a lot longer, but not the highly refined versions and the versions of these you know processed foods. So, it's, you know, you can look at, think of this, okay, so we've always had the animal foods in our diet, but the, the new thing, wh- why don't we look at the new thing? What about the, all these new foods we brought in? Wh- why don't we blame it on those foods before we start blaming it on the thing we've been always eating? I think, yeah, I think well stated, well articulated. Love to get your thoughts on the sustainability. I know you mentioned regenerative farming is an interesting uh, argument there, but I've also just seen literature suggesting that kind of the math on something around even a factory farmed animal versus something like almond milk, right? Like there's a lot of resources required to grow an almond in the desert of Mm. California as well. So I think uh, I'd love to get a sense of the literature and research you've, you've unpacked there. Yeah. You could break down a ton of these arguments. Even you could even say, you could even make great arguments that factory farming is actually not that bad. Not that I'd rather, you know, talk about regenerative agriculture, but the fact you could, yes, like you said, people don't, look at all the resources it takes to do anything. These, you know, anti-meat activists, vegan people, they're eating fruit in the middle of winter, right? It's like, where did this come from? How did this get shipped into you? You know, what about all this packaging on all these different foods, these different vegan foods you're eating? Or what else can we use the animals for? This is a great one. What is the alternative? So if we're not supposed to use animals for food, then we have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of products that we make out of these animals that no one thinks about. So now, you know, it's like tennis rackets or, you know, shoes or anything. What are we going to make? We're going to have to use synthetic versions of this. So just yeah, leather. So now, okay, now we have to make a whole bunch of fake leather, for example, or there's all these highly specialized things like that um, even medical pharmaceutical products and different personal care products that use animal products. So we have to make all the synthetic versions of this. What is the environmental toll of that? What is the environmental toll of of all replacing all the highly nutrient dense calories and protein, the nutrient dense bioavailable protein animals provide, how are you going to replace that? It's going to take millions more acres of this low quality corn, wheat, and soy and uh, other, you know, plant foods that don't have all the amino acids, aren't complete proteins, are not bioavailable, right? No one, no one ever puts that into the calculations. What is the alternative? So a lot of these arguments from plant-based people, they'll say, oh, the calories, why don't we just feed the corn directly to the person instead of feeding it to the cow. So there's two main problems with this argument. One is we don't just grow a whole bunch of corn to feed the cow. The, the, the cow eats the waste products, actually. Like we use, we're smart. We're not, you know, we're not dumb people. We, we're very efficient. Most of the cows, about 88% of a livestock diet is unedible, inedible to humans, right? So they're, they're not competing for humans for food. We use leftovers, distillers, grains, we grow corn for uh, uh, ethanol. Like we, you know, we have biofuels and we give the the waste products of the corn stalks and all this to feed the cows. So that's one thing. Another thing is we need to be talking about protein, not calories. So when you actually look at the amount of bioavailable protein that say beef uh, gives us, 
like how you know you use like the PD cast, you know, the and the, we have the dias. Those are the two systems that show the digestibility and bioavailability of the proteins. Yep. When you look at that, if you factor that in, and the amount of protein, because the protein is the most important thing that humans need, right? We need complete protein. We can get fat, carbs, you know, we can get calories elsewhere, but the, the important part is the protein. If you look at that, cows actually double the amount of usable protein from the amount of protein they eat in their lifetime. This is something that no one's really talking about, that the amount of the protein they eat in their lifetime is doubled when you eat the beef. So, another way to state that is that cow cattle generate protein, essentially. Like the in, input of upcycle, protein. Yes, in, they upcycle protein yep. and, and actually generate, yes. Yes, which makes sense, right? Like, again, I think if you look at what are essential for nutrition, there's essential amino acids, which derives from protein, and you, you, there's essential fatty acids. There's no, and, and, and how does that, what does that mean? It means other animals can synthesize and convert if they're herbivores, carbohydrate into essential fatty acids or essential amino acids. I mean, that, that's what it means. That's a, it's an interesting data point in terms of net production of protein. And I think there's like a funny joke where, uh, Cows are machines that turn uh, grass into burgers, uh, yeah. or steaks, or whatnot, and and it, it kind of makes sense in the light. Yeah, you're you're net producing, generating additional protein here. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And there, uh, I'll throw a few other ones that I can remember. Well, that all cows spend two thirds of their life on pasture. They're not confined in cages their whole life. You know, they they just they take free sunlight and free rain and free grass and turn it into high quality nutrition. So if yep. anything, the story should be, how can we change the system of factory farming instead of we should stop eating meat? <laughs> you know, there, there's a yeah. big New York times opinion piece lately. It's like, Oh, the end of meat is here. Like that is, a, is so far off from the discussion. I mean, that's, it's very obvious that these people twist the discussion because they're not having the right discussion. We're not, the discussion should be how we raise the meat if you want to get into those details, not stopping of eating it. I think that's very sensible. Now, maybe if we touch upon, I think, what is potentially the most compelling argument. And I think I'm still trying to figure out my, I don't think I'm dogmatic to any stance here, but I think the argument that it is mean to eat other living things, especially other things that potentially have some emotion and some level of cognition, uh, that's not nice. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I find empathy towards that. I mean, I think pigs are cute. Cows are cute. Just mm -hmm. like we love our dogs and cats. Is that something mm -hmm. that you delve into? How do you reconcile? Um, do you think that well, I'm just being a snowflake yeah. here or is there something like, Hey, we should maybe. And I think the way the where, where I've landed is I should appreciate that I am taking a life to feed myself. And it's something that I need to be comfortable with. And it's something that's actually very, very natural as a part of the cycle of life where if you've been in the wild, if I've, you know, I remember being on a, a, a safari in Tanzania, you see animals eating literally alive other animals and that's just the the cycle of life uh here's get your thoughts and, and your mm -hmm. feedback on on this topic here this is definitely the hardest one the most nuanced but that last one was great this is how nature works for something to live something must die this is a fact of life and humans have We've invented morals, right? So you're talking about these, these animals don't have morals and they eat each other a lot. But then, I mean, I guess a vegan would say, well, it's great that humans invented morals because that's what makes us human and that's what makes us beautiful. And, and there, yeah, there's some merit to that. But just know that there is no law of nature that says that we should not eat another animal because it's the opposite, really. I mean, we just look at the entire human existence and the evolution of the world and every animal and species, it's life eats life. This is how it works. It's so it's the opposite, right? It, this yep. is the law of nature is for something to live, something must die. Any plant lives because of the organic matter that came from something else dying, right? Whether it's another plant or it was an animal, it, it, this is a harmonious cycle. So 
So that's one big thing that people have to realize. Another thing is, okay, I understand this personal view. So if someone, I will have no problem with someone eating a plant-based diet if they understand all of the argument, that they know that it's nutritionally not as good and they know that it's actually not helping the environment because, you know, taking one plane trip would negate all your your plant-based dieting for the year, right? So it's actually, and plus if we have regenerative farming, you can actually put carbon back in the soil. So, you know, if you're eating a grass-fed cow from your local farm, you're doing better for the environment than eating any of these processed, you know, plant foods. If you know that and still choose to say, I don't like the idea of eating an animal, then that's fine. But other than that, I'm not going to concede any arguments because I've seen enough data and talked to enough really smart people that can show the opposite opinion and show that, in fact, there is no good argument. Otherwise, other than your personal choice that you want to give up good nutrition for some reason. But then I would say we eat an oyster. There there are these bivalves and very nutrient dense, a lot of B12 and iron and zinc and whatnot in in these. So you could eat a plant-based diet and eat a couple oysters once a week and be pretty great. So, and they also don't have central nervous systems, right? So these these clams and oysters don't have a central nervous system. So throw that out there as well. I guess the next level of this. So to illustrate this point, I'd like to bring up Tara Couture. She's an amazing woman. She has her own farmstead. She grows her own animals. She's been studying, she's a nutritionist by trade, but she's been growing her own animals and plants from scratch for about 30 years now and eating an ancestral diet. And she's very into this. We visited her farm and filmed with her. She has the most amazing way of talking about this. And she's up in the Canadian Shield. So many places you're not able to grow crops on and you can only grow animals. So she's saying here, the soil, the soil is thin, there's rocks, there's trees everywhere. To grow plants, I would have to decimate all this. I'd have to decimate entire ecosystems and all these things to grow plants, wipe it out, wipe out entire species, or they have their own 10 uh, cows and steer roaming through the forest. They are in, in between the trees. They're doing rotational grazing, you know, where they move them from paddock to paddocks. And that's a whole another story of how it, you know, it helps stimulate the soil and, and grass and makes things more efficient and all this kind of thing. And that can all be done harmoniously without disturbing nature. And this is so people, maybe we should talk about people eating closer to the environment or, or closer to what's natural in their area, right? That That's maybe a discussion. So maybe if you're in some, you know, lush place where there's fruit trees everywhere, then yeah, eat a lot of fruit. And, but just know that if your ancestors that lived there ate a bunch of fruit, but they also probably ate up, they, or well, we know they ate, you know, different insects and smaller animals. And, you know, maybe it wasn't that destructive at all to the environment. They were, you know, just eating lizards and stuff like that. So that's one argument is that it's, it's dependent on your environment that not all places are conducive for growing plants. And then there's this kind of last piece of the puzzle, I think, is that we're just disconnected from how nature works, right? When you were before, when we lived on the farms, even, you know, less than 100 years ago, if you were living outside the city, you're living on a farm, you saw probably a dozen animals killed before your eyes, before you could even talk. So, you, you you know, you saw this was part of your life. You were, your mom went out, maybe, you know, she she cut the head off the chicken and you ate that chicken and you understood it. No Santa Monica vegans sipping lattes in coffee shops were, you know, they they didn't exist. They're the ones that are most disconnected from the natural process of nature. And it, it, so I guess Tara's point again, uh, I had her on, on the podcast as well, Tara Couture, is that we are just afraid of death. We're disconnected from the circle of life and that humans before us knew all about this. And again, like you said, they respected the animal. They thanked the animal. We had all kinds of traditions around thanking the animal for its life because we knew how important it was for our life. Yeah. I think it's a well-articulated nuanced discussion. The point here, I mean, I, I basically agree with you and especially around the point that we all can have our moral judgments here and happy to, 
allow people if they would choose a certain way to eat that they can very happily enjoy that. I think the danger is when you turn that into a global public policy. And I think what you're referencing with some of the New York Times op-eds and potentially pushing into, you know, what we should be feeding school children. And, and that's not based on personal or individual nutrition and there's no ecological argument for it. It's just purely a moral argument. That's where it's dangerous. Like you should not legislate your morality for everyone. I don't need to force every vegan to eat meat, but likewise, you should not force me to become plant-based as well. So I think like then that, that's America and that's like the greatness of a meritocracy of ideas. But I think that's like the, where I think I have a very hard line in terms of don't be a dictator on the idea side of house, especially when there's no evidence to, to back kind of like more technical uh, side of the house. Absolutely. I mean, yes, hundred percent. We just need to, that's my biggest goal like the most highest, highest level goal is for people to think more critically about all of this stuff and separate the morals or politics from just science. Have you done hunting or butchering of your own animals? So, you know, yeah, I eat plenty of animal products. And one thing that I've been wanting to do, hopefully I can do this this year is to hunt is to take and, and and get kind of reconnected to the foods I consume. And yes, if that means I choose to eat animal products and animal meat, then I should have the experience and be willing to take an animal's life and, and process it into, fo- in, in, into food that I consume. So, that's been something that is on my personal bucket list so I can get much more attuned to what I consume. Curious if that's something that you've considered or, or, or wanting to adopt. I think you've obviously spoke to folks who kind of live that lifestyle. And I, and I think for me personally, it's something that I want to kind of put my money for my mouth at and, and actually have that, you know, blood on my hands, essentially. If yeah. I'm willing to take, eat it, eat it from a, from a supermarket, then I should be willing to take the life of an animal Uh, personally. Yes. I think that's really important. So I have not gotten to that level. I am planning trips as well. And I've done piecemeal uh, parts of, you know, butchering process and doing things, but I've never done the entire thing. I've never taken down an animal and, you know, actually killed it and actually butchered and and ate it. But I think it's super important. And actually, again, to bring up Dr. Bill Schindler, I just did a second podcast with him that's coming out today, actually. So it will be out when everyone's listening to this is this is his main point. And he actually, we actually spent a couple hours going over the New York Times article and talking about all these things. He has a great perspective on this. And he thinks that we should all do this once in our life. Or or he even says each dish you make, you should know how to do from scratch once to learn. And that it is super important, even if it's just bread. So he has this idea of if you do bread properly, it's a whole different thing. Like it is like doing a properly uh, fermented sourdough that he and his family do that takes, you know, two to three days, or you can do it overnight. That's a whole different animal, right? There's not, if you're getting the good grains and your this fermentation process, like gets out a lot of the gluten and, you know, you can eat bread in a healthy way. You can eat almost any food in a healthy way. We just, none of the stuff we have in stores is that ancestral product that, that, ha- that shares its name, right? Even cheese. He says the cheese we eat is not cheese. We have some, just pasteurized, you know, fake product that we call cheese. But the real cheese is something that's raw, something that has these enzymes that go through this, these processes. And again, it gets out the lactose. So these people who are lactose intolerant can eat real cheese. Just no one eats real cheese. It's super hard to find. He said, even you can go to the expensive, fancy Whole Foods aisle and look for the supposedly good cheeses. And they're not, they don't have the the he, the, the ingredient that shows that it's a real cheese. It's basically that they have fake versions of it that make it taste like it. But to do it for real, you'd have to ferment it and it would take a lot longer. So, I kind of got into another discussion of all the foods we eat aren't the way we used to eat them and that changes things. And that also you should be kind of understanding your food more by trying to make it yourself so you see all the process that it goes through. And then you'll know like, oh wait, we spent... Not that it was hard to make the sourdough because it just sat there overnight to ferment or for two nights to ferment. 
But there's a lot more that went into it than buying a loaf of fake sourdough from the bread from the store that just has sourdough flavoring. So that that can extend to animals. So we only use about half the animal when we just get the the store bought cuts of meat. And that yeah. he did a study where they would butcher a deer. So yes, uh, actually I filmed with him. So I was part of this process. We they butchered a deer with me. Him and his 12 year old son butchered a deer for us on film, and we then ate it. And it was delicious. And it was great to see his son, you know, he, he understood all the parts of the animal and, you know, like understood, oh, this is the, the backstrap. This is the tenderloin. You know, this is what we're eating. And it came from this part of the animal. So they, with him and his students, they, they took a part of deer and they actually weighed and measured all the actual food that there was to, to consume that our ancestors consumed, like the bone marrow and the the, the bits and pieces the off, you know, the liver and the organs. And it was almost twice as much, right? It was, it, it went from around 50% to, you know, close to a hundred percent, right? Cause all the only thing you can't, didn't eat is basically just the high, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can eat everything else. So that is a super important thing to learn about is important thing to do. And I think that's a good idea. And I just know that a lot of Again, no judgment. I think like a lot of people like their medallion of beef filet mignon. It's just like a nice, perfectly sanitized, cooked disc. Mm-hmm. And it tastes yeah. great. And, they, and I, they, they don't want to eat the sinews, the organs, and like throw that away. Like I don't even want to think about that stuff. And I think the idea around preparing every single dish from scratch is a, is a, is a pretty interesting idea, right? Because I think then it's like, what is canola oil? What is soybean oil? Like, and then you realize, how do you make this stuff? And it's like, you can't, like, can you squeeze oil from a soybean? I know what a soybean <laughs> looks like, but I've never seen oil that, like, I could yeah. squeeze out of a soybean. Or, like, what is a canola? And how do I squeeze oil out of this thing? And then you realize, hey, these are pretty highly processed industrialized seed oils that I think are getting a lot more attention in the modern diet and, uh, you know, great, on, active, ongoing academic discussion on. You know, are these things like as bad as we, you know, surmise that they might be? Um, but I think just to the to the fact there, just okay, can you from scratch make these dishes? Then and just having works. that grounds up understanding, I think that's a a cool update for all of us to consider and think about. Yeah, I, I, yeah, just at least once, right? He's not saying you have to do it forever, but yes, you will learn a lot from doing it once, and you'll have more perspective. Awesome. I mean, I think we've covered like a broad swath of. Uh, the trajectory of, of human history, if you will, <laughs> yeah. from uh, caveman years, agricultural revolution to some of the latest uh, up- updates in, in terms of nutritional science. What are the top things that are on your mind right now? Yeah, so foodlies.org is the site, and we're still on Indiegogo. We're doing this all with the crowd. We have no bigger interests, you know, no companies or n- nothing. We're just doing it all on our own. So you can go to the Indiegogo, foodlies.org. And just social media, I just do everything on, under food laws and you can find all that. Nowadays, I get really into, well, I'm always into this sort of unifying theory of nutrition type thing, right? It's like, what are the big picture things that everyone's doing well? And what are the big things that people are not doing well? And you can kind of look at all diets and there is, it's very consistent. And we've kind of covered it in a way is that all the diets that are doing well, like any diet for all of history, right? Again, I can say from the ancient people to the modern native living people, you know, I'm going to Africa soon to film with some more tribes. All the people that are doing well are eating whole foods and they're, they prize animal foods, right? And, and they're, what they're leaving out is the sugars and the refined grains and the vegetable oils. So people familiar with Weston Price, you know, know that he went around the world in the 1930s and basically found this, found all, looking at all these native living people and it, it was really consistent is that as soon as they brought in these modern foods and they traded for sugars, refined grains and oils, these industrial oils, their health tanked. They get even intergeneration, the, you know, the older brother would only eat the native foods, whole foods, big teeth, tall, not does it get sick. The younger brother starts eating them. It's a nightmare. Same genetics, completely different health outcomes. So it, it's kind of really simple. This is back again. It's, it's like, let's not get in a camp. I'm in the camp of just real foods. 
So I don't know how anyone's really going to debunk my camp of just eating real foods. You know, that it's that's the only thing I'm really tied to. And maybe, I don't know, what if we have some fake food that gets better one day in, in 50 years? Maybe I'll change my tune. But uh, for now, that's the only camp I'm in is that it's, it's pretty obvious that the, the more whole foods of whatever kind, and I love to embrace animal foods. I have a high animal food diet. I don't consider myself a carnivore at all, but I'm friends with a lot of carnivores. And uh, I embrace a lot of animal foods. And I think that you can have any good diet along this spectrum of plant to animal, as long as you're including some animal foods and you're eating whole foods, you're, you're doing fine. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple when you, when you put it that way. And you don't have to have all these wars of, oh, well, I'm keto and you're not keto. Well, I don't know. I'm keto most of the time, but I don't care if you're not. And I understand how you can be healthy uh, using carbohydrates and whole foods and that, that that's one you know way to do things. So, it's also the, about the level of processing. So, it's kind of implied in what I was saying about the whole foods. And then, so on one end is the, you know, the most whole sources. You're just getting meat and eggs and fish and vegetables. And then the opposite would be the most refined is the sugars, refined grains and the oils. And then there's a spectrum in between. And it, it really kind of your health, I think, just linearly correlates to your percentage of processed foods you eat, right? As you go down towards the sugars, flowers, oils, your health goes down. And it's, you can almost just graph it on your life. Okay, this is the volume of food I ate in my life. And this is my metabolic status, right? I think it's pretty linear. Like that's just kind of yeah. what I've come to is that it's pretty linear. And you can take a look at someone who's 300 pounds. And I mean, I would highly, highly correlate that to the exact amount of processed foods they've eaten. I don't think someone can become, say, twice their size if they were supposed to be 150 and they're 300 on a whole, all whole foods diet. I believe that's directly correlated to how many processed foods they've eaten. Yeah. So, to summarize Brian's Grand Unified Nutrition Theory, it sounds like you have maybe two laws or two axioms. One is the dimension around processed to whole foods and we want to lean towards whole foods. And then I'm, and would you agree with the second, and potentially, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like there's a, another potential dimension or axiom around animal foods. And the nip pick here, you could have a vegan whole foods diet. So, how does an animal piece uh, fit into uh, law one? So, it doesn't exactly. That's why I have, I actually do have a diagram of this uh, yeah. <laughs> that I can share, but it does have, it's a four quadrant diagram right and it's it's plants on the left animal foods on the right and then it's whole foods on the top and processed foods on the bottom and i kind of graph out all the different diets and the standard american diet is at the bottom my sort of sapien framework i call it the sapien diet sapien framework sapien whatever like it's not a diet it's a framework it actually spans most of the top where it spans all of animal to plant ratio except for we leave out the zero percent we leave out vegan where i just don't believe that is a it, homo sapien type of diet so you could say as long as you have a few percent of animal foods in your diet you're in the sapien framework right you're in that top of this box and i think that it's optimal to include more animal foods but this is not part of my acts you know i'm not saying it's a linear relation but because you can get oh, complete proteins, it's just a lot harder and you're going to have to eat a lot more calories if you're trying to get complete bioavailable proteins from plants. You're doing a lot of combining and you might have to be getting some exotic plants or you might have to be even processing. Like the guy from the Game Changers, Patrick Baboumian, was eating, drinking like, I don't know, four giant uh, pea protein shakes per day or more. Yeah. And so they showed him on YouTube doing all this stuff. So, Basically, what I'm saying is it's possible, but I think it's not optimal and that yeah, that people who include, from what I've seen, people who include more animal foods in their diet do a lot better and this seems ancestrally appropriate. But I'm not saying it, it's required. Yeah, I think it's a great framework. I think, you know, if we want to, you know, go into, okay, if I want to optimize for being an Olympic athlete or optimize for certain specific applications, given a specific context, we could maybe chop up the sapien quadrant into 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 smaller subgraphs but i think overall i directionally align that 
yes, it seems that the literature today points towards whole food unprocessing as strictly better than processed artificial industrialized foods. And I think, I think that's like a very fair way to put that strictly vegan diets are very, very hard to execute without supplementation, right? Like there's not a lot of vitamin B12 in plants, period, yeah. full stop. So it's, it's hard to argue that you can be generally optimal without having to add artificial B12 in and there's other micronutrients that are lacking in purely vegan diets. And I think it's, that's like, that's a weird position to argue that I am ancestrally more consistent, but I have to eat these super refined 1000 microgram, you know, pills of, of concentrated B12. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So I love to stay in touch and hopefully when you're ready to go live, we'd love to have you back on and talk about the launch. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for letting me come on and talk about this. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the HVMN podcast. If you're interested to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit hvmn.com slash pod. Please remember to subscribe. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please give this video a like and remember to hit that bell to get notified whenever we post. We also have a dedicated Discord server, which you can join by first taking a short survey and then I'll personally send you an invite to join the community there. The link to that survey will be in the description along with any other relevant links. And we'll see you all next week.